Hello, Internet. Welcome to That Silverline Show on Tuesday. We have the wrong header up. Let me grab that real quick here. Uh, wherever that went. Uh, excuse me. Boop, doo, doo. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I'm your host, MTK, and you might notice he's a little quiet right now, but I uh, are joined by Jose Fuentes, uh, currently coming to us from uh, the lobby of a hotel somewhere in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Uh, um, I hope you join us. If he's a little quiet, let me know. I'll see what I can do to fix the audio. But uh, that is what we, ha- what we have for tonight. And we're going to be talking about building a comic book world. So um, the elements of world building, uh, if you go through any sort of creative writing class, um, depending on the teacher you get, if they like genre, they're going to tell you that world building is the most important thing you can do. If you get a teacher who likes literary fiction, they're going to tell you that world building does not matter. Uh, <laughs> and um, in comics, it's especially uh, important to world build because there's also a strong visual component. Um, so uh, we are starting off the new year. So maybe we'll, um, I might try to be a little bit better about keeping discussions focused, but that's kind of not our thing. So we'll see how things go. But I, have, I do have some prepared questions uh, for us to work through. And it'll let us, you know, go from there. So whatever happens, happens. But at least we have some points to come back to. <laughs> we make the attempt. Exactly. Uh, if Jose is too quiet, you might just need to turn your uh, audio up on your on your screens uh, all the way. Uh, yeah. Okay. So when I'm. Uh, uh, when I think about world building, especially for you know genre work, and most comics are in genre, fantasy, science fiction, um, the fantastic, what have you, uh, um, except for you know most Marvel stuff because it's just New York. But um, uh, when I think about world building uh, for a genre, the thing I always think about is uh, something that all of your you know genre enthusiastic teachers will tell you is that your world should be another main character. Uh, there's always something that grabs your attention, and makes it make, makes you want to know more about the role itself and not just about the people you're seeing in the world. Um, uh, you know, classically every, every Potterhead wants to go to Hogwarts. Everyone who reads Lord of the Rings wants to live in middle earth. And it can be one of those things where even if you know, the world is terrible in some way, you still want to be in it or immerse yourself in it. Cause you know, living in middle earth, you're very likely to get stabbed by an orc or die by the age of 30, but you know, you get to live in middle earth and that'd be great. <laughs> um, so, uh, Jose, what are kind of your thoughts on, on making the world its own character? Uh, what does that mean to you? I you... Yeah. I think world building is great. Um, as much as as it is important to make the characters, you know what I mean, give them their own personality, giving different regions of your world personality is, is just as important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like what you said there, right? giving regions personality, because, I mean, uh, we're D&D nerds, uh, as stated on the channel many times, and that's a really good example. It, it, D&D is already separated into multiple planes, but even just in the current main universe, Faerun, with the Drist books and Boulder's right. Gate and all that stuff. You have Boulder's Gate, which has its own personality. You have Waterdeep. You have the Savage Frontier. Um, Ice and Dale. Yeah, the, uh, the Golden, uh, the Silvery Marshes, and like you know, like the Golden Sands. And each thing like definitely feels unique in its own thing. And you can spend hours just exploring all the corners of each individual city. Right. And that's where my my like enjoyment for world building came from. I mean, like you said, we we talked about role playing before, but like the idea of of trying to narrate and like just describe, you know, the area they're at, just so that your players can get a better feel, better sense, you know, of like any foreboding you might have going on. Right. So, I think That's- that translates really, really like well, and and it's pretty important in comics as well. Definitely. And it's one of those things that, you know, uh, it, uh, it's, it's fun for us even just to do it because, you know, we love painting. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're dungeon master in a game or if you create mediums, you probably like in some way painting the picture either with words or with actual art. 
and and just seeing the the knowing that when someone experiences that they're going to be odd in some way because that's always the the joys of when you describe something hey hey hey, pops when you describe something in the dnd campaign right you you want them everyone at the table to be like whoa but you can also like reinforce that in yourself when you experience world building um classically you know uh in that same vein the opening the skyrim once you finally get out of the castle and you walk out the mountain path and you can actually see the world that they developed (laughs) Uh, so, uh, of course, as creators, we need to ingest media to know what we like and how to present that and, and create our own media. So, uh, Jose, what are some examples of moments when, like, pieces of art or books or comics or, or movies or whatever where uh, the world building really stri- like hit you hard? I think... For maybe for me, it was uh, when when uh, Marvel Comics started introducing the Savage Land. Oh yeah, yeah. That was like you took them in, in like from New York or, or wherever they were, uh, great, great, was a great Lakes Avengers and whatnot. But it, you would all of a sudden be transported them into an entirely different scenario, an entirely different genre. All of a sudden, dinosaurs and, and crazy mutates everywhere and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think that was like. That was just bold, like to me. That was like a huge jump from like everyone was accustomed to, to like just flipping everything on its end. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, to see in the same vein for me, I have some experience with when they introduced Limbo, um, and when they continue to go back and develop later on with different characters, and you get a different, get to see a different side depending on who goes there, right? And all different things that reflect like. Magic's experience in Limbo is completely different from Doctor Strange's, and they have moments where they intersect. But uh, seeing moments where they go into like, there essentially is a different hell dimension that isn't exactly hell, but it operates in a weird way that's weird and tricky. Right. Um, that is, I mean, that that's weird to me. Like, I mean, yeah. it's hard for me to grasp. Yeah. Like, I feel like. I think the, the physicalness of, like, you know, like I said, Velociraptors attacking you and yeah. like that in that regard. Or even when uh, was it the X-Men uh, were in uh, the Outback. Oh, yeah. You know I mean? yes. Entirely different, different scenario, entirely different different mentality like of what they can do and what they can get away with because so there's nothing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And... Uh... He says something there where, like, you know, you didn't grasp on the limbo as much as I did, but you grasped on the savage lines more than I did. And, you know, world building can be different for everyone. Everyone has, like, you know, you have some people who are more sci fi sci fi heads, and people who are more fantasy heads. And, you know, comic people are typically somewhere in between because comics are somewhere in between. <laughs> um, or you, know, you can enjoy both, but enjoy different elements of both. Like, some people only like hard science fiction or there are set rules. Or people like more of the science fantasy where yeah, faster than light travel because we said we can. <laughs> uh, so uh, you like more of having that. Well, uh, for that, at least you like having the more the physical grounded element of the Savage Land opposed to the wackadoo of Limbo. But it, if you were to you know go further on the scale to like science fiction or fantasy, do you also like the more grounded elements, grounded elements there? Or do you do you like, is there a point where you start liking the stuff that's a little more out there? Um, I like sci-fi in that, you know, especially like anything that's like graph, like it's in the future. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, I like that stuff like that, but for me, it's more the fantasy. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and was it a uh, X of X of Swords, Swords of X? Uh, um, uh, X of Swords. Yeah, when they started going into, I can't even remember what it's called. Uh, Apple. Apple. Avalon, yeah. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, the typical X-Men characters all started becoming medieval and whatnot. I thought that was really, really cool. Yeah. Like, that's that's more more of what I can grab a hold of. You know what I mean? Sure. I like, uh, I like that, too. I think uh, what my thing is, I like um, I like things when there are uh, systems, but systems that don't necessarily need to be heavily defined. So I, I, yeah. I like Limbo because like, there's a system to it, but the system was that things don't work the way you expect them to. <laughs> Right, uh, so you, you don't have to over-explain. Right. You do, you do, you do. 
Yeah. But then when I go into like science fiction, I like things like The Expanse, where it is hard sci-fi. Like there is a clear line of theoretical science that explains why things are working the way that they are. Or then even going back to it, well, I like the ND fantasy because it's just kind of like, but even then there is a loose system to it and that, you know, Druidic right. magic and Ranger magic comes from the Feywild. And if you're a celestial caster, then your powers are tied from an element to some god and things can interfere there or what have you. So there is still like a loose system, but very loosely. But I also like Brandon Sanderson's um, was it Stormlight Archives, where there's a very clearly defined and hard set magic system. Like, no, this is the science of magic. <laughs> this is how you <laughs> magic write. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah, I can definitely see the benefit of both. Definitely. I, just, I like when I don't have to explain much. <laughs> Definitely. And there, there are moments, too, when I like things just to go absolutely but like Bonkers Wild. That's why I like Warhammer and stuff like that. Where their explanation for faster than travel is demon dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to travel with the demons to go faster than light. That's how it works. There's no other way. Uh, right. It just makes sense, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, the the uh, orcs uh, paint all their vehicles red because red is the fastest color. <laughs> and because they're uh, innately magical, they, they are. The red is the fastest color. <laughs> so if you paint something red, it goes faster. <laughs> I think that's eight-year-old uh, mentality because you had red tennis shoes, you ran faster than everybody else. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So yeah, definitely. Kind of, now we kind of went over stuff we like and why we like it and why we think you like it. Um. Writing and world building. Um. You'd almost think that the Certainly in, you know, traditional books, the onus is on the writer to build the world because that's all there is to it. It's just text on a page. And you right. get to, your job as a writer to show everything. So, But in comics, as a writer, I don't want to say you get an easier job in the world building, but you get a different job. And it's not in you to take the picture. You provide the scaffolding and the outlines, and then the artist will actually assemble the world within that <laughs> yeah um so uh there are different ways to go about that uh the way i write i find the right lends itself to world building really well and i think um you can see that in wolf hunter and then eventually when soul senate comes out you'll be able to see that it, writing essentially full outlines beforehand and then full script where each panel has its own description because I'm trying to paint the picture in my head as much as I can for the artist to then interpret and paint their own picture, sometimes literally. Um, uh, and uh, somewhere along the line, that matches the dialogue, and then the reader gets the final version of the, of the world. But you get them getting this really cool exchange where the world has essentially been built three times. First right. by the, in the head of the, of the writer, then in the head of the artist, and then it finally gets interpreted and the pages and the spaces in between the panels gets completed by the reader um so as as the artist uh or inker or however you position yourself in that timeline jose as a more artistically inclined person in the process uh how do you feel about that process and and what do you like about it i mean i think i said it before yes definitely that that uh I like working, like if I'm doing any kind of pencil work, or even if I'm creating of anything, any world and whatnot, like keeping contact with the writer, right? Like because I've created, like especially for role playing, I've created an entire map. Oh yeah. Map sitting out. You know what I mean? What is over here? What's over here? You know, the climate and whatnot, and just for everyone to play in about this much of, of the whole thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. But it explains like where a particular character came from and like just the regional stuff, like I said. But I am I actually enjoy that. I know it sounds weird to some people, but I actually enjoy that. That's fun. Mm -hmm. And being a part of that and and so from a creative point of view, like if the writer is if it is descriptive, that just makes it that much more enjoyable, I think. No, yeah. Um, because yeah, you can as an artist you're still putting your own feels, you put in your own, you know, concepts, your own your own, uh, 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 what's the word? Um, your own inspiration, I guess, into it. But that inspiration still comes from what the writer wrote. And mm -hmm. if the writer's descriptive, then I think that 
that just lends to to really like helping you know, like a very like vibrant vibrant world. Definitely. And I think you it says something uh, cool there that's you know if the writer's descriptive, it can help provide inspiration for the artist. And I think a lot of new writers when they get into it, uh, they run. They they're afraid of you know am I being too handholding for the artist am I being too domineering yeah. am I not giving enough and I think there is uh, I think if you're ever a writer you should always side on, go on the side of giving more kind of whatever medium uh, no the only exception being exposition if you limit your exposition at most times if possible <laughs> but uh, unless you're creating you know and then um, an apocrypha style book because people pick up your podcast first because people like worlds but um right uh always on the side of you know providing more detail i mean there's something like you can be controlling to an artist if you get to the point where you're spending an entire page describing one panel essentially saying it needs to be exactly this way but if you're describing the exact motion being taken you know, the style of what everyone is wearing, the type of room it is, you know, if there's something that's important to the plot or something that is important to the character, mention it because the right, the artist isn't going to read your mind from, you know, however many miles away. <laughs> uh, but, you know, provide as much detail as you can um, uh, because, you know, unless you're taking a full page, you're, you're probably giving uh, the artist just food for them to, to churn out more stuff because, you know, if the, if you and also provide references, uh, if you know you're yeah, asking for specifically want, in yeah, the beginning, like there has to be this like this concrete statue of an eagle staring down while picking its nose with the claw, and that's detrimental to the story. So like, like if you have a reference or something like that that you oh, that yeah. you like specifically want in there, like oh, but this multi falcon has to look like this, right? You know, that's definitely. Important. Like yeah, right. I wrote a comic and I had to essentially reference like he's wearing scale mail in the style of uh yeah scale mail in the in the style of uh, Lorca Sigmatatum, which is the Roman imperial uh, scaled plate. <laughs> right. I don't expect every artist to know that, so I just found something off Pinterest attached to it. <laughs> it's off with it. Uh, it's like it's not exactly this. This is just the style for his sci-fi armor. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I did that for. Uh, I basically call it a murder board. I did that one yeah. when I had designed characters for school, and one of them was like, a, I think it's a, I think it's Sabu, which mm-hmm. is like because it's a water buffalo. I took <laughs> Sabu and wore like a Turkish armor. It's oh, like yeah. leather, like leather plate, or not leather plate, but leather panels all over the place. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I had to describe what that looked like and <laughs> pull up any references for that. That was a blast. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, um, I think it's very hard to, to go overboard with details as, as the writer in comics. Uh, uh, and if your artist does have an issue with it, they'll let you know when they should yeah. <laughs> maintain healthy communication. <laughs> but, um, and that's just kind of, you know, one part of it because, um, you also spend time, uh, like I said, depending on how deep you want it, you might need to, you know, create a map or create uh systems and and uh yeah, infrastructure and all this other stuff uh riding wolf owner i luckily i didn't have that issue because uh you know london is a real place and it exists <laughs> <laughs> um but i did have to you know figure out like how fast did trains run back in you know 1940 and uh what was the uh time from like how how long would the train ride from london to uh the uh, northwestern ports be uh, what would did the weather be like? Help, say, did you do that to help with pacing? Yeah, help with pacing. Like, okay, is this going to be like? Is this a story take place in one day? Is it take place over two days? Um, would there be a sleeper cabin on this train? Um, uh, or uh, did they were they still running private cabins at this point? And uh, also, fun fact: they, uh, there's actually a lot of private cabins on trains because all the like big public cabins were got requisitioned for supply trains. <laughs> right. Um. Uh, and you know, working all this other stuff into that, uh, and it is fun going through and just kind of researching and building out your own storyboard. Like your 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 board, your your world. Uh, I'll go into the big two later on, but what they call it would be the story bible. Uh, 
more often than that, uh, at least if you're independent, like you're going to have more text in that document than you will in your finished product. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think, uh, well, depending now, because Batman, I think, had the record for the biggest Bible. Uh, of course, there's a ton of Batman co- uh, things, but I believe they need to update the Bible several times a year because there was one of the few properties where, like, yeah, just introduce new characters all the time. We kind of don't care. Just make new characters. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, for I know also some people have their favorite parts. For me, I'm always a fan of uh the again i didn't really need to do this for wolf hunter because it was allied england and nazi germany but for other things i like creating the political and governmental structures uh you know uh which empires are worth who you know which small kingdoms or duchies are working with what um uh is there a spy in this kingdom who's doing this for another thing blah 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 um because you're going to end up creating more characters way you go down that, and characters provide some of the best plot hooks that tie you back into the world. Um, uh, I know some people get really into the economics, too. Uh, I do lightly, but I know some people are all about, like, there, there's a river here, so that means that they probably do, uh, they have, a, like, a wood shoot, and they probably have good farming, so this is an agricultural town, and they probably trade with this place, which is a mercantile kingdom. Well, so, uh, Jose, what are kind of your uh, favorite parts of of world building, what kind of things do you really dig into when you're creating? Not that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like. I mean, other than terrain, I like. I I enjoy describing the terrain, especially um when it comes to like, in in regards to like different adventures that I've done. You know what I mean? Describing like uh, ancient ruins or statues and stuff like that. Like that stuff I like to explain. I like to describe. Um, oh, yeah. Like, you know, you're going to have a jungle and there's going to be a, a overrun temple there. But, like, it's like, it's role playing. Of course, it's going to be. You know I mean? Yeah, of course. But the best part is to explain it. The best part is to describe it. Like, this mosquito buzzing around their faces and stuff like mm. that. Um, some of that I can translate into comics. Yeah. Um, but most of my experience with world history was with role playing. Oh, yeah. And, um, I don't like getting into, I like getting into the lore, like, mm-hmm. there's a history here, there's a story that was told for this particular relic, or this particular, like, destroyed temple, so like, that's the stuff I like, I like the legend stuff, as opposed to, like, the political intrigue. Yeah. Probably because politics doesn't appeal to me, I mean, I literally had to ask people what certain things meant about our government, because no. I didn't understand. Sure. And, uh... Thankfully, they didn't laugh at me too hard when they explained that. <laughs> yes. Well, then I seen about writing... Uh, I, go, uh, uh, I like to go for uh, a web of Buddhism. Yes, I like... I, also, I do a lot of vampire. I think... Well, vampire especially, but uh, with um, writing my version of science fiction and, and the fantasy I like to do, the nice thing is I can kind of avoid all modern-day politics and base it mostly off of, you know, Roman uh, politics, or um, you know, like the uh, politics surrounding like the uh, uh, late Middle Ages, the creation of Magna Carta. How did like all the um, like the the barons are billing? What did that politic political structure look like? Um, or even uh, the uh, Reconquista of Spain. The, like the politics there weren't as clean cut as you know you might think, because there are a lot of people who kind of were working for either side or didn't really side. Uh, there were some some Moorish uh, dukes who were working with Spanish kings. Some Spanish dukes who were working with the Moorish kings, uh, the, uh, the Caliphate, and uh, El Cid, uh, the knight who worked for both sides, got right. married. Uh, El Cid is one of my favorite characters from history. Um, <laughs> but uh, 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 so I, I like that side of politics. If I had to go to like you know create a world where. Well, maybe if I get too deep into the Roman stuff, I might need to. But having like you know, like three days of filler western discussions, that might be a little too much on the the political entry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I it. Years later. Yeah, exactly. I think well, two th- the two things you said there are also really important for creating a world that sticks with the reader, and that is the lore, and also the minute details that really paint the the image. So the minute details, like you said, the mosquito buzzing around their head, the death of swat or whatever. Right. 
and you can even do that in comics where you know if someone's going to some place that they uh, they do in you know comics all the time they're in a fan or whatever just you know you can reference it in text or you can just show dude sweating or like uh even change the way their costumes are designed like the x-men changing their costumes working the outback and all this other stuff or even uh when now the the change in costumes going from to uh Krakoa and everyone's now wearing more sleek futuristic and all very militaristic type outfits or it looks like oh these guys are you know actually in some sort of uniform because they're except for the marauders marauders are like pirates exactly <laughs> we've got we got we got a well even then i mean that's a good example because you have the marauders who are uh essentially you know the uh you know, the golden age of piracy buccaneers working for krakoa <laughs> right uh and they're dressed like pirates so you have uh a, a panda wearing a headband uh <laughs> <laughs> yes it's okay um you do yeah, but uh, one of my favorite things is with X Force, you we get a tactical Black Tom Cassidy, Black Tom being like one of the weirdest dudes, but he's wearing he got rid of the collar, he's just wearing a, a tighter vest, bandoliers. <laughs> uh, I like Black Tom back in the day. Was it was the black and red outfit that he had? The black and red, yeah. They yeah they did they brought back the black and red color uh, color scheme, but they just changed the way it looks. It looks like he's you know not just some guy who crawled out of the vines. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he spends all his time crawling all the vines. <laughs> right. Um, and the other thing, being the... Um, uh, what's it called? Oh, the lore. Uh, the history. Uh, because that's what makes the world seem lived in. You don't need to, you know, create a, you know... Uh, you can create a full like a thousand years of history of, of who knows who is and uh, George R. R. Martin did that. And perhaps that's why we're not getting book six anytime soon um, <laughs> for Game of Thrones. But uh, uh, giving each region uh, how the exiles interconnect is glorious. I agree. <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I, it's like the only like, mainline comic that I still read is because uh, uh, of how well, uh, how much brain power the editor seems to put into the X titles? Because <laughs> it's it's always a different team, but I feel like they Marvel always gets like the the editor who's okay with getting the least amount of sleep and just like pouring over everything to work on those. Um, but uh, uh, you know, creating small legends and fables about towns like oh, you know, we don't know how we got founded, but this is what you know my my, my grandma told me and all this stuff for giving characters their own lore and backgrounds. And, um, you know, if you create a, a, a religious or God system for your um, world, what's the creation mythos? What is the, you know, are the gods active or inactive? And what's the reason there for, you know, did, did, was there a schism and the gods had to leave or was there some fight? And the gods like, okay, we need to watch over everyone. So we're going to like stay here now or put like sentinels, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, thinking about the classes of roads, the, um, you know, like, well, uh, guys are fighting, like, well, humans are kind of dumb, so we're going to put some titans outside of roads to make sure that people don't kill <laughs> the city. Right. I like the idea of, of adding pantheon to, to a story yeah. or uh, um, a world as well. Like that, you just mentioned that, but that, that, that's actually, that helps to, to, uh, to find some of the characters, like some people in this village, they mm -hmm. may be like, oh, we just about, and, and then even taking aspects of real life, like say, if you take a, a particular region and they are very much like Amish people, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. the Amish of any fantasy world in that. I know it's fantasy world regardless, but, um, like, then you have people in like cities, like, you know what I mean? Like, major cities that look down upon them, just like, you know what I mean? You know what happens here too, like with like other sort of Amish people or any other sub, you know, culture that is different than than the norm and than yeah. the status quo. So that's interesting to include that into it. Like, man, there's so much you can do when when you build worlds. Seriously, absolutely. Um, we just uh, created characters for a uh, one shot, uh, or not one shot. We created the other session zero. Um, for our new campaign, which is going to be a, uh, we actually opted to do a long form campaign. So hopefully we can ruin the DMs lives over uh, the next few years. I'm not DMing this one, which is going to be fun actually to play again. 
Um, but uh, the world he created, uh, he he did something kind of similar where he he wanted to mirror kind of the Reformation, uh, but take it to extreme. Interesting. Also mirror that. So the idea is that there were there's uh, two main gods, uh, uh, the embodiment of order, the embodiment of chaos. And at some point, the gods fractured uh, and became, and each became two. So you end up getting the people that worship the old personality of order, and then the, the reformers worship the new personality. And the same thing happens mm-hmm. with the chaos pantheon. And kind of looking at the creating of dominations within that, what if that was actually like a, a little representation of, you know, the gods splitting apart? So essentially, more churches fracture off that are all, you know, denominations of the same church worshiping the same god figure but they all believe in a different aspect of him more so than the other ones do so uh the god of order is also you know a part of him is the god of agriculture and all this other stuff uh and so uh and because that you know, getting a ton of churches to grow up so it creates up creating like a very uh like faith-based society where like it's impossible to escape every town has its own separate church which may or may not be related to something else and Mm -hmm. the same way that uh your artist can interpret the world that you create and run with it as a player or as a reader you're going to interpret something or with it your own way um so if you're a writer who is inheriting some established world building to write on to create a new story in which you know in comics, what happens more so than other mediums, if you get end up getting picked up by a publisher with a long running title, like, hey, we want you to write a series based in here, go to, go do it. You don't necessarily need to go buy the book. You can find ways to play around with it. So what I did with my character, I used two books. I used the Eberron lore book to choose my race and the uh, Tasha's Cauldron to pick my subclass. So okay. I'm a Kalashtar Psy Warrior fighter. <laughs> <laughs> so very psionic based but the way we're flavoring it is that uh my character at, at one point was in the job got ron he's like a mob enforcer at job, job goes run he dies wakes up a hundred yards away he recently resurrected and there is now something else inside of his body which he quickly <laughs> learns to understand it's a spirit which may or may not be from this world but there is a spirit which has escaped the afterlife which he's been told like there's a set afterlife that, that works this way <laughs> And now there's a spirit that is go inhabiting his body and giving him sound powers. So his whole thing yeah. now was like, man, I got to like catch up on my religion and figure this out. <laughs> right. So he's now he and he's uh, he, he's a mafia based character. So he's a, like a little inherently selfish. So his first thought is, well, if this thing that's haunting me escaped the afterlife, maybe I can too. And maybe that's my best bet at getting some level of immortality. <laughs> Wow, that's pretty in depth, dude. It's, it's pretty in depth. Yeah, it's, it's fun. But yeah, that's uh, the way way you kind of think about. You know, you're presented this world within it, and you're like, okay, what are some tools I can use to play with that? When you're writing something that's set in a world, or if you're writing historical fiction, you're presented the world, but you don't necessarily need to present that world in exactly that way. You can find ways to play with it. That's kind of the same way I, I think you need to think about it. It's like uh, writing Wolf Hunter. Uh, I didn't just want to write the story of the Tizard mission and a very straightforward retelling of World War II history. I wanted to create a spy story right. in there. So what's a plausible way to play around with that? And uh, and how can I fit in something that is unique and interesting in uh, a story which is, is, you know, at this point, set history? Right. Um... I have a comment on that. I drew blank. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, let's see. Did we did get a chat. Uh, I've got working on a modified Japanese mythological system set in San Francisco, which is fun to work with. Nice. Uh, cool. Definitely makes me think of uh, Blade Runner or Shadowrun. Um, I, I love. Uh, oh, also um, Ghostwire. Uh, sci-fi Japanese mythos. Um, but. Yeah, uh, I mean that's a fun way you're, you're presented with, you know, a, a Jap- the Japanese mythology and the city of San Francisco, which are two set things. But how do you combine the two and find ways to play around with them or, or explore it in ways that may not have been done before? Yeah, that gives you options. You know what I mean? You yeah, free 
like pre-generated like reality i guess you have know, san francisco you know they're buildings that people are going to recognize you want to make sure that people are going to recognize the building so they recognize the location yeah and then go crazy with all the the neo yeah <laughs> it. and that's like yeah whole thing where you can like you know how do you like fit in like um you know I have a, a wind spirit fight uh, Oni on Salesforce Tower. Like, how do you right. incorporate like the uh, the uh, what's the the city tram? A lot of other sun stuff in there. Um, so I did actually have uh, our next question here. Uh, so kind of going over um, all the different things you like other to research and world building, all the things you like to play around with it. Uh, when you're starting to build a new world or starting to work within a, a new world that a, a writer presented to you or what is kind of your starting point for research? What do you, what do you dive into first? Um, I think for me, like I said before, it's, it's history. Like mm -hmm. um, if I want to create a history, I, I created a, a part of a world. And like I said, like, people playing about that big of it. Right. Yeah. But, I ended up having a desert area, and I was playing a lot of uh, was the Stone Prophets, Raven Lost Stone Prophets. Yeah. So I really wanted like an Egyptian feel to it, and you know what I mean. Like the sand itself was was trying to kill people, and even though the players never ever went in that direction, but I had it set up ready to go. But it's always like searching, like I guess the references that I that I look up. You know, if I see a picture that I like. Yeah, and I want to incorporate that in, but that's part of that's part of the research for me. You know, what what animals would be in this continent? What I mean, what is what's going to grow here? Um, I like stuff like that. Like I know, like you said, you mentioned people like the politics part and whatnot, but I like I like researching what what flora fauna is going to be in this particular area. Like I'm not going to have. You know, an oak tree full of lush leaves and whatnot right. in an Arctic area because I mean, it's gonna be so out of place. Like anybody that even has a remote interest in that in real life is gonna be like, "Oh, that must be a plot thing because right. you know, <laughs> tree grown." And I'm just like, "Oh no, I'm just a moron that didn't know it couldn't be clear." Right. You don't want so, to. Uh, I like to look at my references. I like to keep my references. Definitely, you don't want to create an accidental uh, critical role chair where. Uh, the chairs are so <laughs> out of place that everyone gets focused on for over an hour. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> oh, definitely. But that, that incorporates into like uh, to, uh, comics because mm -hmm. my comic, Devil Boy, it's, you know, it's set in like a Serengeti temperate type of, of, of like region. And I say Serengeti just because I like the trees that are there. It's very flat. It's very like a plain area and off in the distance you see you know you can see the mountains not yeah. mountains and whatnot but like there isn't much to to hide behind there isn't much to you know what I mean in in the pictures that I have for reference in there. So all, everything is up front. Everything is like you see it coming so you I mean protect yourself or defend yourself as such. Right. Right. So when I when I was creating the the you know the landscape for devil Point, that included i had to include that fact that there's not going to be hills or like giant like forests for people to hide in, in behind you know, right. when it comes to the um antagonist for, for devil Boy. you know what i mean yeah like everything's going to be up front and as much as i don't necessarily do subterfuge I have to like I have to stretch myself and like work to include some of that. Otherwise, otherwise you're everyone going to see everything coming, and I kind of want to hope to, to surprise these people. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? So I take the landscape into that effect as well. Like yeah. how, how you know the the players, how the characters in the story are going to see. Like I said, they're going to see everything coming. Nothing's going to be, nothing's going to be like other than undercover in the night. Everything is, is up front. Yeah. So how do you defend yourself against something that you know it's coming? And more importantly, how do you, how do you like not so much trick, but how do you like um, outwit someone that sees your actions as well? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think what was also interesting with um, 
writing uh, Wolf Hunter and me being more focused on like you know writing the 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 research and doing like the political intersection stuff end up running to uh, creating you know similar 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 issue and then come overcoming that creating a spy story that's all set in one train right uh, every, everything seems like it should be up front but you need to create layers of subterfuge to get around that so you had to, I had to research reasons why people would lie but still be good people or be innocent okay. people so essentially I end up creating a uh, a variation of, of, a, of a train right of a London where this guy stuck on a train full of liars and he's trying to find one liar in a group of people who all have something to hide. <laughs> and so that's, that's a line I think he actually has coming up towards the end of it where he says like, everyone is lying about the wrong thing. <laughs> it's like, right. it's like, I'm talking about their lies, but I need them to lie about the right thing before we figure out what's happening. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you, uh, you end up having, to, so like on the political, on the, on the, you know, on the the political uh, personal side of that, whereas you know you had to research like you know how why would how do people move at night? What would you use to find terrain and cover? Like how would you avoid something that you know is coming when like it seems like any sort of like cover is very scarce. Right. Whereas I'm looking at uh, okay, why would nobility want to lie at this time period? Why would a commoner or like some person who's just going from you know london to surrey or whatever why would they need to lie why would uh or dover uh uh, you know and finding things about like well you know at that point a lot of people are losing a lot of money to the war because they're essentially selling off giant plots of land so a lot of nobles that were previously well to do were now suddenly on the verge of going bankrupt and so they had to lie to keep men's or do back alley deals in order to get land back and all sort of stuff um dealing with uh the fact that even though england is part of the allies um if you were uh romani or jewish you weren't necessarily welcome to disclose that op- openly <laughs> to people because right. they, they thought you were part of the problem <laughs> uh and so kind of finding new ways to uh essentially make people liars when uh the store when the hero wants them not to be, but the story demands that they lie, how do you find liars in 1940s <laughs> England? <laughs> and so it's you're just kind of stealing real lies that people would have kept hidden and then putting them in a location. Uh, uh, the same way that you would find, you know, real elements of uh, maneuvering and, and staying hidden and put that into a geographical biome. That is a lot. <laughs> yeah it's that's the the fun ways to, to think about role building is you're essentially uh you're creating something by pulling things that happen and then putting them into your own setting and putting your own little spin on it right and those are like little like for like character nuances and whatnot that that help to like create like the layers or like you said like the story on a train you know what I mean? yeah at a, at a base core, it's a story on a train, and you have to create those layers that keep people wanting to peel and, and look. Yeah, and yeah. you know, where's this headed? Where's this headed? And like, not, it wasn't necessarily, I mean, other than like historically, like this, I, I know that, uh, you know, couldn't get a cathedral yeah. in one of the one of the pages, uh, for uh, what is it, the Christmas, Christmas book, I think. Yeah, we right? yeah, can have that. He and, did. Uh, They did two uh, things that Richard Card is on a reference. The first is he did the interior of St. Martin's on the field. Yes. Do that scanned in. The other one was the exterior of the BBC uh, a day <laughs> after a uh, British uh, bombing run had dropped uh, a. Um, essentially an aerial mine that detonated on uh, the like fifth story window. Right. 
And so you had to find so, like the right location to put that marking in. <laughs> those aren't necessarily like, I mean, those are like aspects of the world that it helps to, to like fill in uh, on this train right story. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's it's little things where that's not all the world's defined by, but you do those little details. It's it's like the guy swatting the flies away and he's walking through the swamp. It's that little right. thing like, oh, something happened here that caused us to look this way, or um, like, you know, uh, this is a um, an actual event that people go to, and it has pretty significant significance, which is why they're using this big church. They're using this big church in the middle of still being bombed by the Germans. So you're, mm -hmm. you end up creating these levels of implied significance or implied history to to the events surrounding the characters. And, and that's cool. Like, I dig that a lot, you know? Yeah. <laughs> because to me, those are just, like, added added things to, like, just to, to strengthen the story. Mm -hmm. That just for some things like, like I said when we're talking about like uh you know in Amazon style rainforest and overrun ancient temple and stuff like that you know what I mean those little stories that like the villagers are telling about right. out here each person is gonna have a different story that they're telling but like if you laid them all in a row diagonally they all tell the you know the, the yeah. truth. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's fun. Like, like interest, interest, in introducing that. You know what I mean? Into a story where I think it's a little to me anyway. And I haven't tried it yet. I'll be honest. Um, but trying to incorporate that into a comic book story, I think, is a little different. Oh yeah. Um, you would almost have to like lay the panels out all across, and and then have each person tell the story just slowly work its way across yes. you know what I mean the page so you can see that each person had a little bit of it but when in regards to the role playing like that's easy like just have them go like the people are going to go your players are going to go and investigate it and you're just like well yeah this person and me personally from like a story like that I tend to write it out mm -hmm. that way when I'm actually like telling the story I'm actually reading what I wrote that way I know yeah. you know where to line up at definitely uh, there is um so interesting ways you can I think if you work well with your artists, there are some interesting ways you can almost kind of do that in comics as well. Uh, like you had said, where you need to lay each thing out different, differently in a panel. Uh, but you can still make that visually interesting depending on, you know, how wacky you guys are going to go with the panel structure. Um, right. There was, uh, and also you need to be okay with abridging scenes, which I know some writers like the darlings, but if you can't abridge a scene and get the reader the information in a way that is much more compelling than talking heads. I choose that all the time. Uh, but there was, I think, was it Tomorrow of Truth? I don't know, it was that or something else, where the, essentially the protagonist had done a series of interviews to complete an investigation. Um, but instead of showing us each individual interview, they uh, uh, are in uh, what is like uh, a church with a stained glass window, but they turned all the stained glass into a different panel. So each so each piece of stained glass is a different character, and it's their part that creates the full truth in that section of stained glass. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's okay. Yeah, I, I'm uh, always find ways to bridge storytelling and and find ways to get back to the panel structure uh, because that allow you to, you know make the characters and the world that much more uh alive because you're, you're the unveiling the truth about the world in a way that makes the characters much more digestible right yeah well, it has been uh just about an hour uh i don't uh know if we'll go for a full 90 minutes today i think we'll let jose get back up to his hotel room <laughs> and have a hotel lobby. um but yeah uh any final thoughts uh, jose on um, world building um those uh teachers that prefer the literary aspect and and only want to create characters and whatnot yeah. i would fail that class <laughs> i know yeah literary fiction is a i i do i, I appreciate it and i have uh written and published some 
but it's, you know, you can only write about a person having an epiphany while a kettle boils over so many times. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, uh, I need my robots with laser eyes and my giant dragons. <laughs> right. No kidding. And enjoy your dinosaurs. Yeah. Like, when it comes to describing your world, when it comes to, like, talking about it, like, saying, oh, yeah, this cool part right here, and, and it, it's, it's cool because of that. And, and, and the cool part about it is, dude, come on. Yeah. There's a source for a reason. Definitely. Oh, I think, yeah, that's also probably something important to mention before you do go on is, uh, you know, I, I, I give this advice all the time, and every other writer does, you know, is don't over explain, uh, you know, show, don't tell, or so. But don't confuse that with cutting all the detail. Like when you're creating a role and then you're creating the role building, turn it into an absolute meal. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If you, I, I, I've had, I've had, um, um, where I was doing artwork for a story and it was, it didn't last very long. <laughs> Me working for this, but uh, they, they, I guess the writer was like, was like pretty descriptive, like, oh, this character is doing this. And, I, I think it was, he was flipping in the air to kick somebody and very descriptive about kicking them with the left foot and whatnot, but like didn't tell me at all where they were. Oh, yeah. I'm like, that's a great scene in the air. Yes. <laughs> like, where, where is this happening? Like, right. you're, you're so, yeah. Yeah. You, I, be yeah. generous with your descriptions. Definitely be generous with descriptions. Um, as a writer working with a different artist, uh, the establishing shot works for two reasons. One, it gives the readers context and it allows you to be descriptive and really create that like world building meal where it's like we get to see everything about where they are and you can see all the cool toys that we've created for the reader to the consumers. But also, it works for the artist because now you've grounded them like this is this thing is happening here. <laughs> right. Yeah. We were taught like sometimes like it's okay to like create your establishing shot. And then you don't have to worry about it the rest of the family. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and depending on how, how the story plays out, you don't have to worry about the rest of the family. It's just like they're at a cafe. Be very descriptive about the cafe you're doing. And then it's just a matter of heads talking. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's different angles as an artist, there's different angles that you'll take to, to expedite getting that page done you know what I mean? without sacrificing, you know, the imagination of, of where they're at and what's going on. Absolutely. Uh, it's, I mean, uh, every Avengers comic get to that get get to the mid comic splash. You get the Hell Carrier. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. You know, it exists for a reason. It it's cool. <laughs> it looks cool, but also it sets it sets the scene. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. All right. Uh, my cat's eating my other cat's food, so I'm gonna throw a penny at him real quick. Down in head. <laughs> All right. Uh, but yeah, that has been. Uh, that's the show on Tuesday. I've been Tim TK, uh, joined by Jose Fuentes. Uh, you have been you, dear chatters. Uh, we'll be back uh, next week. I do actually have a subject this time. Let me pull that up real quick. Next week, we will be talking about... Uh, where did I go? There's... Uh, Next week is the 10th, and we're talking about uh, comics and color theory. So uh, if you're a colorist or if you uh, yeah, if you enjoy painting at all, like I uh, I will be bringing, uh, I, even though I don't do any comic art, I can bring some you know, relevant mm -hmm. subjects because I do paint miniatures and portraits and busts all the time, so that's my thing. Uh, so I'll be bringing some some color theory in there from a painter's perspective as well. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah, I got a couple of thoughts on that. Okay, okay, cool. Um, be sure to check out 8 p.m. Eastern time Wednesday and Sunday for Wednesday Wham and Silver Sunday. Uh, we'll be back next week, 8 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesday. Uh, but until that time, make mine silver line. Silver line. <laughs> hey, I'm Pat Broderick make mine silver line.